kid and you're asking like, what do we do about? Is you sign a contract with someone. So real quick, before you did that, did you... More than 30 years. I got my real estate license in the... Um, and your your origin story. Is that he uh, he made an age joke the last time we were... Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna use that KUKA. You know, I, I'm a little more strict with what I'm, I'm looking at. Uh, Show of hands, how many people here would consider themselves a real estate investor already? Okay, that's a, that's a really, really good amount. And how many people are investing in mortgage notes already? I guess. I'm going to teach you why. I'm going to teach you why. And we solve a large problem of that, which happens to be inventory. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit later about the group we have uh, where we provide inventory. But I am general partner of Elios Capital Group, which is a $50 million note fund. And I want to share more of my background and how I got started into real estate too. Because like many of us, I stumbled into it. My parents did not invest in real estate at all. And so I'm originally from South Carolina. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina now. And at a time when I feel like in the black community, a lot of our parents and grandparents were moving up north for jobs, my grandfather decided to stay. And so he was a sharecropper in South Carolina. My dad was one of 12, didn't finish high school, had to work, tell my grandmother to provide for the family. My mom was a bank teller for a large part of her life until I went to school. And when I went to college, she went back and got her degree to become a teacher. But we did not grow up in a family where we were talking about real estate investing, really investing at all. It was definitely get an education, get a job, you know, go into corporate, and that's how we were going to build wealth. And so I actually majored in uh, broadcast, German minor, wanted to be a reporter until I found out how much reporters made <laughs> coming out of college. It was under 20000 at that time. It was a rough life. Uh, and so I kind of stumbled into business. So German minor, I always wanted to go study abroad, but we couldn't really afford to pay for study abroad. And like many of us, I was blessed to have a professor who really believed in me and he literally printed out a piece of paper for a U.S. State Department program and put it on my desk and said, apply. Amen, Amen is right. <laughs> and I actually didn't believe I would get into it. It was like an all expenses paid trip to Germany for a year. A visa, we were youth ambassadors. Then we picked 75 Americans from all over the country to go. And so I did the first application half-heartedly. Like, oh, dang. they're not from South Carolina. They're not gonna pick me. Got to the second round. You know, got a little bit more excited. Got to the third round, and they interviewed 150 people, and 75 got to go. And I was blessed to be one of those 75 that got to go. Uh, got to go. Thank you. And I didn't realize I had actually never left South Carolina. I just went to college in my hometown. So this is the first time I ever even left home. And I get there and end up doing an internship at BMW, working on an SAP project which if you're not familiar with SAP, it's a very large scale tech system. I knew zero about tech, got the job because I was fluent in English and German, and they wanted me to do the communications in both languages. That was why I got the job. But I stumbled into tech and realized what an opportunity it was. I ended up coming back to the US, starting a career in B2B sales at AT&T, telecom career for anybody out there who was working telecom, and then, they transferred me out to California. This is in the height of 2007, 2008, which you just spoke about. There's not a lot of jobs, especially not entry level when you're just getting uh, started. And so they transferred me out to California and I would end up meeting my boss at Starbucks there who uh, told me I could get my first big girl job or I could get on a plane and fly to work. It's like, you can live anywhere you want as long as you're willing to get on a plane. And so that was my first foray into tech. And I'm telling you all this for a reason, so I really get to the real estate part, but I think this is really important. And so once I got into that tech job, again, didn't have any coaching from my family, I ended up getting a job where they made a lot of commitments around pay, but none of it was in writing. And so within nine months, I found myself in a position where I was making less money than I was making at AT&T. And I ended up quitting the company to go to another job, but I had signed a really nasty non-compete. And uh, 
within six weeks of being at my new job, this company chased me down at 23 years old uh, on a non-compete, and I was back out of work after six weeks working at Olive Garden, waiting tables again. This is also where my husband, we are uh, just dating at this point, but I just told him he to go to culinary school, and so we're making culinary school payments out of pocket. Both of us are back in the restaurant uh, at Olive Garden part-time, just trying to figure out how to make, make things work. And so the one mentor I met while I was at that tech company ended up going to another tech company and said, hey, I think you need a job here in California. They don't care about a non-compete. Come over here. Apply for the job. And you know how you can feel it in your bones when something's for you? I, I was like, this is it. I went in, killed the interview. I did a 30, 60, 90 day plan. They told me this is the best interview you've ever, I've ever had anybody do. And wouldn't you know that at the end, they declined taking me uh, on the job because they wanted someone that lived in California, Palo Alto. And I had just moved back to Charlotte because my older sister was sick at the time. I need to be close to family. And so they turned me down purely because they wanted someone to be local in California. But what do you know that three weeks later, the phone rang and they called me back and they said, we interviewed all these other candidates in California, but none of them were as good as you. And so we're gonna make an exception and you're gonna be the very first person that we hire uh, from and that was the other big thing that changed my life. And it's been in the next nine years of my career working in tech, Silicon Valley Tech, and got to do it from Charlotte, so I can still stay close to family. And so I'm working the corporate ladder, moving up the chain, pushing through, pushing through, lots of obstacles I'm gonna drag you through, but as a black woman in tech, I'm sure you can imagine what they were like. But then I got to a point where I realized people were making the most money on the other side of the table, investing. And in tech, you see a lot around venture capital. Are, are you, anyone here familiar with venture capital? So if you're not familiar with venture capital, effectively it's when people uh, are investing, saying well, we're investing in real estate, but they're investing in companies. Now it is definitely high risk, high reward, but people are making 30%, 50% or higher investments. So you see all these billionaires out there who talk about being an early investor in Google, right? early investor in Uber is through venture capital with how they invest. And so while I'm working in corporate, climbing the ladder, you know, six figures, golden handcuffs, a lot of us have worked in corporate, you know what it's like. I'm watching everybody on the other side of the table make money on the investing side. And I said, how do I get into venture capital? Which is a space that is less than, no joke representation wise, less than 2% women in my degrees and above. And so I managed to break into venture capital uh, and start to sit on the investing side of the table, learn how the odds were stacked against us on that side of the table too. Not only were black people and women not getting money to put in their companies, they also weren't getting the opportunity to put their money in deals. And so I'm not gonna talk about venture capital too much today, but I did join and help start a group called Cap Table Coalition, which are all black and Latinx investors, where we take the space on cap tables. And so I started writing checks, investing in companies. So here's the other thing. I want to tell you guys at the same time, venture capital is again high risk, high reward. You're investing in your, what you believe that people can do. And I'm like, that's cool and all. I like it, we're getting access to good deals. But what about real estate? What about real estate investing? I actually think I like that better because it's backed by a physical asset. And so my husband and I, at this point, the guy I was dating in culinary school, he's my husband. We stumbled into real estate in our first home where we took our wedding money and instead of spending it on a wedding, we put it up down payment on the house. It was by accident, but we did that. We loved to Vegas, bought our first house, and within three years, they had appreciated over 30 percent. We then refinanced that house, took the money out, invested in our first investment property. And so like many of us, it's kind of the same as my journey in tech and real estate. You learn about the levels of the food chain and you go up the food chain. So we started with fixing and flipping properties, like many of us. That was all good and fine, until you have some really, and I know somebody's about to talk about fix and flip, so I'm not knocking fix and flip until you have a really bad experience with fix and flipping properties. It is Once a day that I would pray for you I'd go and misbehave just so you'd notice too Sneaking looks up and down from across the room 